Hello, and thanks for listening to the very first episode of the Mojo Podcast. I'm Richard Stokes, and I launched this podcast to allow real people to share their Mojo stories, to reflect on times they have lost their Mojo, and to share their experience, wisdom, tips and techniques for regaining their Mojo. My day job is as an executive coach, trainer, and business consultant. After a 20-year career in the advertising industry, I now live in Ibiza with my wife and our dog, who I'm walking right now. And on this episode, you'll hear why we live here and why I decided to set up my own business. Frankly, I lost my mojo, and not for the first time. So I made the profound decision to change my life and to rediscover this vital essence. On this episode, I'm interviewed by fellow Ibiza resident, Joe Yule, a podcast legend and experienced radio producer. And you'll hear me talk about how I define my mojo and the times I've lost it, including after going through a divorce, and actually losing a bit of joy for the uh, the corporate job I was doing. We get into the changes I made and the new course I chose to navigate to get the wind back into my sails. Now, as this is a new podcast, you can really help me and help more people discover the Mojo podcast by doing three really easy things. First, please subscribe and you'll be notified when new episodes arrive. Please rate the podcast and five stars would be so, so generous. Most importantly, please write a short review. As I say, all of this makes the Mojo podcast a bit more discoverable for more people. So thank you. I really hope you enjoy listening and you join us here each week as I interview more brave and fascinating people sharing their Mojo stories. Welcome to the very first edition of the Mojo Podcast with me, Joe Yule, and of course, the glamorous host that is going to be uh, taking proceedings forward after today's uh, episode number one. Uh, that is, of course, Mr. Richard Stokes. Good afternoon. Hello, Joe. How are you? I'm very well. It's um, just a ridiculously, stonkingly beautiful day that you've chosen to record this on, so thanks for bringing me here. Isn't it? It's, uh, it's a lovely day in Ibiza. Sun shining, we're sitting... Not quite with our feet in the water, but with our feet in the sand. And it's late November. So, yeah, all is good. How is your mojo today? <laughs> so, my mojo today is, and I'm, I'm asking all, all my guests on the podcast this, um, and asking them on a scale of 1 to 10. You know, I think mine has to be a 9 out of 10. And the only reason why it might not be a 10, because this is a lovely moment, and I'm trying to be these days a lot more in the moment, is I'm just a little bit fatigued after a pretty busy week last week in, in good old London. Um, it, was, it was a very good week, but I do pack a lot in when I'm there, and I'm feeling a little bit, a little bit tired, but so apart from that, I'm feeling good. I mean, there's not many people, I think, on a, on a Monday morning that are going to be feeling 9 out of 10 in, in the mojo department. And, um, I mean, for me, I'm feeling 10 out of 10. If this is my job, I get to sit on a beach and interview somebody um, for a, a wonderful podcast um, that I've helped kind of jivvy along a little bit. I just feel like this is just the best thing in the world, and um, I'm really feeling just really, really happy. You're right. I, I went a bit Craig Revel Hallward on Strictly there, <laughs> didn't I, by going, I was seeing some kind of perfection in front of me and deciding it wasn't quite perfection. <laughs> enough I know, what, 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 what do you want Richard out of what more do I want in life good lord nine and a half <laughs> there you go I thought you were going to break out the American smooth then <laughs> mojo obviously mm. this is a great great word that you've kind of you know clarified your business with but I guess what does that actually mean to you that exact word so what I'm you know, part of the reason for doing the podcast and just meeting all these wonderful brave and fascinating people is to ask them that, that question and what I'm finding is mojo is a universally understood word. People get it immediately, almost globally, which is great. But everyone has slightly different definitions of it, which I find really, really interesting. And that's why I'm asking the question. So but for me, my mojo is about energy. Fundamentally, um, I know when I'm, I'm on it, when I'm feeling good, when I've just got that f energy flow, um, kind of coursing through you. Um, so it's almost this, it's slightly indefinable, but I believe it's entirely manageable as well. And that's important because something that's so important to you, if you can make effect, whether it's small change, big change, to work on Mojo, 
And that's really important. And for me, when I've got that energy, I feel more certain, certainly more confident, more resilient. I find making decisions just a lot easier. So when my mojo isn't quite there, when I'm maybe a little bit, haven't quite got the energy flowing, I'll dither a bit, I'll be, uh, I just find it hard to make some big calls. So I, I definitely know when it's, when it's there um, and energy would be a, a, good, a good summary of, of what that essence is about for me. This podcast is obviously going to be all about people's mojo, that energy flow that you talk about, and I guess sort of diving into people's stories about what keeps that energy flow mm. flowing. Um, so what do you, you know, what exactly have you got in, in mind for this podcast exactly? So I guess the reason I started it um, as, as kind of sort of selfish <laughs> reason and, uh, and slightly less selfish reason. So I, I love meeting interesting people listening to them hearing their stories that's what I do as a, a coach and that's a bit different because I'm working on a very specific thing for them and what their goals are but I love those conversations and I thought I really would like to have more of those conversations but in a, you know in a in a not in a confidential manner but in something I can share and so for me it's just meeting these wonderfully brave and fascinating people and hearing their stories of fundamentally I guess of change because what, what I'm hearing a lot of is I've kind of went from a state to a new state and really understanding what small changes, big changes that people need to make to get from one state of a lower mojo to a new state of a, of a higher one. So that's um, what I'm finding really interesting. I hope for listeners that those stories just sort of form a collective library almost of of oh, so that person was doing that, maybe a bit like I'm doing, working in a, in a, in a corporate environment perhaps, and it's, it's not quite for me, and I was thinking of setting up something of my own, but I was a little bit nervous about it because that sort of change is a bit scary, frankly. But collectively hearing these stories from people that have been through a very similar scenario and, and found a new path for themselves, I'm just hoping those can help other people make the kind of change that, that I made you know, by, by leaving the, uh, the corporate life, setting up my own um, business and, and moving to Ibiza. I'm not saying everyone's going to come, but everyone, everyone's got something that they're probably thinking about doing that they know would really fulfill their own inner potential. And I really hope that if just one person listening to this can make that shift, I'd be incredibly proud and very happy. I'd be incredibly proud and happy as well. So that's two of us. <laughs> what a great way to begin. Yeah. And, you know, is that why you kind of wanted to be the first guest on your own podcast, I guess, to kind of share that story and that kind of, you know, level of inspiration that you're looking for other guests to lead forward? Yeah, I um, believe me, this isn't, this is a bit uncomfortable for me. I'm a bit out of my comfort zone because I'm the listener. That's usually my position. I listen, you know, really well and I help people with their stuff. And here's me talking about my story and I'm, I'm a little you know I'm a little uncomfortable with that but you're making me feel very comfortable Joe so thank you I believe that it's important for me to be the first guest on this podcast because I'm a little bit almost uncomfortable with it and I need to show a bit of vulnerability because that's actually what I'd be expecting from from my guests we want to get into some pretty deep stuff mm -hmm. and if I'm not going to go there then how can I expect someone else to to go there so so that's why I'm here uh, and also to kind of to set up, I guess, some expectation about what listeners can can uh, can expect to hear from the Mojo podcast every week. Um, and yeah, these you know stories of of as I say, these small changes that might lead to big change that just allow you to kind of maybe free yourself a little bit from what you think your narrative is. I think everyone's got in their head, well, I'm a uh, I don't know, father, I'm a corporate person I live in a certain place and that is my story and that could be perfect but what if it's not quite and what if there are some changes that you really feel that you want to make um, and we're going to um, explore loads of those stories every week here and what you'll get from the guests I think is yes there's you know the, the inspiration of their story certainly some wisdom because someone's been through something that they're willing to share and I think there'll be some, you know, there'll be some tips and techniques as well that we'll we'll share along the way as as well as as we go. So yeah, that's why I'm 
I'm putting myself through the, the first difficult interview. It's really not difficult to be interviewed <laughs> at all. It's nice to tell your story. What is it that's kind of um, zapped your mojo in the past? There must have been a moment that led you to wanting to create this podcast and, of course, your business. So there's certainly, you know, two key moments, I guess, in life for me, which were fundamental low mojo moments. Um, and, the, and the first was to do with getting divorced. Um, so I'm now, I'm very happily married again for the second time, but I was married earlier on in, in life and, and we were tripping along quite nicely. Um, and you know what? I don't think, we're both fairly young. Um, I mean, people are getting kind of married and committing a bit later and later in life these days. And we're fairly young. And I don't think we really knew quite what it meant to be married in this kind of what you had to do. There is no guidebook <laughs> that I'm aware of anyway about marriage and, and how to succeed at it. Um, and we probably both lacked some role models in life around us in terms of that kind of guidance as well. So as, as time went on, you know, it's actually my, my ex-wife that called it. She said, you know what, we're just not kind of ready for the next step. And the next step would have been, you know, having kids. We're not ready for that. And I don't think we're in a great place. And that was a real shock, but kind of not because I kind of knew, but, it, you know, she had the bravery to front that up. Um, so we we separated and, and, and got divorced. And, and that sounds very clinical, but it was, you know, of all the divorces in the world, it might have been the most straightforward because we didn't have kids. Believe it or not, all our friends were entirely separate friend groups. So it wasn't like we had to have argue over friends, let alone CD collections. It was pretty straightforward. And bef kind of before I knew it, I was, you know, I'd been with someone for seven years and then I was single again. And it was a real kind of shock because when you're, I think when you're a partnership, you're kind of building a future together, you're making plans. And there was me, single guy. I was living day to day. I mean, it was kind of what's, what's going on. I was making some not great decisions in terms of um, uh, relationships. Um, I was partying a lot, and, which is kind of short-term fun, but not long-term. And then it took, I was, uh, I was at work and someone came in to give, um, to give a talk. And this guy, uh, Steve Hewlett's his name, he was the media editor at the BBC and, and very sadly passed away a few years ago but a very very wise man and he just talked about himself actually he actually talked about his own mojo and his career and he said he he knew he had to make change when he realized he had and he used a sailing analogy and I, I sail he said I had no steerage it means I couldn't pick direction because I had no wind in my sails because boats don't go forward unless they've got wind in their sails and you can't pick a direction you can't choose a course and I just sat in this talk and went my God, he's talking about me. That's my life right now. I have got zero wind in my sails. And if I'm going to move forward, I need some wind in my sails again. So I made some decisions. I, um, I kind of looked at my, uh, the, the, the business I worked in and asked them some questions about, look, life in London's all fine and, and dandy and comfortable, but maybe what else is available for me? And in the end, I ended up moving to Poland. Um, which is not quite what I expected maybe when I said, oh, look, we're in the, this global network, this big company I work with. Where could I move to? I was thinking maybe Sydney or New Zealand, <laughs> maybe Paris. And uh, Warsaw, Poland came up. And I was like, oh, OK. Um, you know, famed for vodka and cold. Uh, but you know what? I did it and it was transformational for me because I did it for me. And I made it work and I created a role for myself and I created a whole new social life. And I had, a, as it was, nearly two years out there and I had a fantastic time. And that put that wind back in my sails and enabled me to move forward. So, yeah, that was, um, that was a biggie. And that sounds like a very bold and brave decision. I'm, I'm seriously, seriously impressed. I mean, what on God's earth decided to, yeah, made you make that decision? That's a, quite a random left of centre one. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I guess the decision, my decision was that, right, I'm going to look for more opportunity. And then the, I was presented with an opportunity and then I had, a, you have a choice. Do I take that opportunity or not? I was like, I think I need to. Whether it's the, the place I would have written down and said, this is where I want to spend the next two years, it's probably not. But it was a wonderful place um, full of really lovely people. Um, the tremendous irony being that my wife's family are actually of Polish descent. So I actually spent some time very badly learning Polish 
but it did mean I could actually have a little bit of conversation when I did eventually meet my wife and, and her family. So, you know what, the universe has strange ways of putting you in a certain direction, doesn't it? Uh, and that happened there. So, yeah, Poland was great. I think the corporate story is definitely something worth diving into as well in terms of, you know, how did you get to the point where you wanted to leave this massive, great, big, high-flying career and position that you had in the, uh, in the old advertising industry in London? Yeah, so mojo loss number two, I guess. You can recognise where your mojo is and you, sometimes the loss is immediate and you go, oh, it's, it's gone, like the wind had gone out my sails with that divorce. The second one was more of a, if I'm going to really stretch the salient analogy, the wind just fell out of the sails bit by bit by bit. Um, and yeah, I was back in London, married, very, very happy, um, in a good job that I you know, really enjoyed, really enjoyed it. Um, but bit by bit, the job started changing. The industry has been changing an awful lot. Um, and I found I was definitely getting a lot less joy um, from what I was doing. And actually, I was working with a, with a coach. So I was being coached, which is fundamental to me now being a coach, actually. And um, my coach just asked me, it's a brilliant question, Richard, what gives you joy? And I thought about it, scratched my head, and there's probably a very long, awkward silence. And I thought, it's actually when I'm working with people and I'm helping to develop people, that's when I'm at my best. And that's when my mojo is flying. Um, so I kind of have to focus on that. So in, in corporate life, I, I did as much as I could to get to those kind of opportunities. So I trained you know, 400 of our senior leaders around the world over two years, which was fantastic for me. Um, I tried to take sort of a coaching conversation to when I was working with people who worked with me and to help them develop. Um, but then, you know, I think we got to the point where um, my wife and I talked about the move to Ibiza. We talked about it for two years. <laughs> I say these things take time. And again, working with my coach really helped me get over all the fears that I had. How will we pay the mortgage? Where are we going to live? What am I going to do? What's going to bring me joy again? And I worked with all those things. Um, but I had the answers. They were, the answers were inside of me and they, and they kind of came out. And so the combination of me thinking, so this is what I could do. Um, you know, I retrained as a coach. I thought really carefully about the sort of business I wanted to set up and the consultancy that I could do. Coupled with moving to this beautiful island, started to make that decision crystallize in, in our minds. It's still a tough thing to walk in to your boss's office Actually, we didn't have offices. No one has offices anymore. It's all open plan, isn't it? But we, we got a meeting room and had a chat and said, uh, look, I'm, I need to resign. And the look of, what? Why would you do that? You're, you're doing really well here. All, all things are good. Well, and I laid out the story of why. And, um, had a, you know, really good understanding boss said, OK, well, I get that. That's amazing. Um, how can we help you? do that so I transitioned kind of dr gradually out of that and that was I think so important not to kind of step off the corporate merry-go-round and then into something new straight away I actually had um, the best part of 10 months in terms of transitioning both as a full-time employee and then as a consultant and that was so helpful um, because you know where you are with an income you can start to build up your business as well so that's a I would definitely try and give that advice to anyone thinking about doing something fundamentally different is how can I start to build that thing up maybe it starts as a bit of a side hustle first and then you move into doing it full time and you can learn an awful lot about what your business is going to look like in that time so that's what I did um, and and just saying it it's, that sounds really sounds a bit straightforward it, it did take a lot of time a lot of work a lot of soul searching but now I'm sitting here on this beach in the sun having this chat would I be doing these things if I was obviously still doing my corporate role of course not and that's why my mojo is at least a nine and a half maybe it's gone up to ten Joe in this conversation actually when you actually play it all back to yourself <laughs> I think it's actually an 11 it's gotta Richard be, it's got to be an 11 um, so yeah but you know a lot of work and and having and with my wife working through it together I can't overstate how important that was for me and the first decision I'd made was entirely me for me but the second time was for us and we helped each other in those moments of questioning and the sort of gremlin comes in up into your mind about oh it's just, we can't do that can we and then fortunately as a, as a partnership the other person hopefully is in a more optimistic state at that point can help you through it and we did that we did we, we were we were inadvertently coaching each other for months to get to the 
to point to make the decision to, to move. And that was, um, what, 15 months ago. Yeah, and here we are. So what was the final catalyst, though? I mean, there must have been that sort of real moment, the final kind of nail in the kind of London coffin is like, yeah, we're actually going to do this. I think, again, just going back to working as a team, my wife put me on the spot. We'd been talking and talking, and we were actually on holiday in another lovely island, uh, Tobago. And she just looked at me over dinner and said, look, are we going to do this or what? And I was like, oh, that's the question. And I know if, if I'd have said, look, I'm just not ready, I just can't do it, she would have supported that, absolutely. But it just, I think, made the conversation. It had to have a sharp end. And that was a sharp end. Are we going to do this or what? And we decided to. And now we're here. It, I guess the important thing is we didn't fall out of love with where we were. I still love going back to London. It's a hugely buzzing, dynamic, meaningful place for both of us. But you make a choice, don't you? Mm. Um, and our choice is to live this calmer, simpler life, much, much closer to nature. Um, as I said, we're on a beach now. I probably go to the beach a couple of times a week at least. I, I was swimming yesterday and it's late November. We're walking in the hills. Um, we have a dog, so he's just living his best life, obviously, <laughs> in his retirement. Mm. I mean, I have a podcast called The Reset Rebel, and it's about sort of techniques to reset oneself. So if you woke up tomorrow morning feeling completely out of whack and the mojo has gone right out the window for no particular reason, wrong side of bed, whatever it was, how, what's the first thing that you would kind of do to get your mojo back? Well, I, I do have a pretty set daily routine, actually, which is entirely around that, and I'm very conscious of it as well. So um, we meditate every morning, actually twice a day, um, Vedic meditation. So that's a 20 minute, uh, 40 minutes a day practice. And that is just foundational. If I don't do it, I'm definitely a bit out of whack. I'm a bit out of sorts. And when I do, I have this um, wonderful energy, um, you know, as energy linked to mojo, it's really important to me. So the, the meditation is really important. As I get a little older, <laughs> I find that stretching is super important as well. And this is another morning routine. I get up and what I've had to do is lie a, a yoga mat is outside our bedroom. So I can't ignore it. It's there. I can't walk past it. I need to do, it's only five minutes of stretching or something, but I just know I feel released. You know, on a really, really practical level, I've got to have a good breakfast. I can't get going without um, a breakfast. And back to, so we do... Vedic meditation and also lots of we take lots of learning some Ayurvedic um, uh, practices and thinking especially around the food that we're eating so I have a hot breakfast every morning and that's generally generally porridge actually and people what even in the in the summer in Ibiza said yeah it's it's having that hot nourishing soulful food in you from the get-go just gets me going and if I do those three things I know the day is pretty well set and it these are the things that I can control there's, I talk to a lot of my, uh, my clients about uh, what they can control, what they can influence, and what is outside of their sphere of influence completely. And if you know these are things that I've, I've, I, can, I can do this or not, it's up to me, it's my choice, I think that's very powerful, actually. And those are the things that I can control, and I do them every day. Mm. I'm exactly the same. You know, I've done all those three things this morning, <laughs> in, the, in that order, hilariously. Ah. Would you say that the meditation then is kind of, you know, were you meditating before you got to Ibiza? Yes, we've been, my wife's been meditating for four years. I've been meditating for three years. And yeah, Vedic meditation is, is, is the practice. So it's mantra based. And, you know, you just make sure you fit it into your routine. And I, I just know, you know, when I did the, the training, the, the teacher said, look, some things you, you might just not notice and, or connect something to the meditation. But it's really important to say, ah, maybe it's the meditation that's making me calmer. Maybe it's the meditation that's giving me that energy. And I know I, I, my, my triggers are much, either they're harder to press or they've disappeared. I'm significantly calmer. I'm a lot more patient. And patience is something I really have to work on, especially when you're a small business owner. You know, you're writing proposals for people, you put them out there, and then nothing happens. And you're like, what's going on? What are they thinking? When, 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 when are we going to do something together? And I've just worked on, and the meditation, absolutely fundamental to this, just trusting that when it's important for that person, that company, it will come around and then we'll have the conversation. 
I guess your whole premise of your business is is moving people forward and you know allowing them to be more aware of the areas that they want to expand into and work on and develop um, to obviously keep their mojo high so I think you know changing people's ways of thinking is is kind of crucial to that whole process it's it's trying to you know I hate using cheesy terms like get out you know think outside of the box but it's you know moving here in the first instance immediately catapults you into a different stratosphere of thinking in a new way you know you've got your routine you've got your you know your vista of beauty and nature and and all the things that kind of you know make you feel good but how do you actually what's what's you know what's the kind of crucial coaching tip I suppose that you share with your clients how do you sort of encourage them to, to change their their mental process the, you know, the fundamental of coaching is it's around self-awareness so you you can't think about change until you understand where you are right now so working I work my first session with clients is always around the current reality what's going on right now for them and starting to think about where would they like to get to and when you've got that in place you can start to think about um setting some goals and making those achievable and then I guess what I do I give you know for me my my approach to coaching it's I tap into or I'm allowing someone to tap into their own self resourcefulness it's if I tell someone you know you should do this you should do that you can do that that's all well and good um, but it kind of sits there for a little bit and then will fade away a person has to fundamentally believe and know that they can make those changes in their life and so work I think the way to look at change is to really think about what are the small things that I've done that have created something better so I do a lot of work again around just looking at lifestyle and history of where have you done this before where have you done this before and that builds this sense of a self-resourcefulness that we all have that we but we really need to draw out when we're thinking about bigger change so start, start thinking about those small things and then and then bigger ones can follow because change is is difficult for some people it's a very triggering word actually um the very nature of it so we have to just just work through what can what the small things first that can help the big things we can all absolutely change our ways of thinking um and it can be so it's important not to i think don't focus on changing you we have to be our authentic selves but when you have a goal in mind you can start to make change around you to get to that goal and that could be changing your environment changing a relationship changing the job you do for example and the more that we do that I think when we get into habitual idea of making small changes for big ones um, you actually start to rewire your brain and we can start thinking differently but you have to be doing this on a fairly frequent basis to keep on making change keep on making change to, to make those big ones because if you want to fundamentally make change you look at okay i need to change maybe what i believe because when i what i believe leads to my behaviors so you have to fundamentally look at those kind of belief sets so i do a lot of work on people's values and strengths that kind of ladder up and, and get you to that to that point what are the things that you connect to then to make you feel secure and safe and uh, you know like you're not kind of just spiraling out of control and in, into any particular direction that maybe isn't the one that's going to set your world on fire. Yeah, and that and that's a, a very pertinent question for me because I'm not a I'm not an out of control <laughs> person. You know, you know, we have you have friends. Some people I describe having no off switch, and I've definitely got an off switch. I'm I'm sometimes I've had the off switch applied at a, a good time that's helped me out, and sometimes I've probably missed out on stuff by activating the, the off switch. I'm much more, I'm much more in the moment here. There's something about living on this island, um, uh, in this in nature here, that just makes you more appreciative. And you talked about this at the top, I think, about just enjoying the now. I have spent an awful lot of my life fretting about the future and maybe worrying about the past. And there's not a huge amount of value in either, to be frank. But you have to work that out for yourself. And it took me a good 40 years to do that so there you go <laughs> it's never too late to start is what i'd say never too late to start something um but i have i have and i think this is going back to the rewiring my brain a bit i am so much more in the now than i've ever been and it really sometimes slightly freaks me out but then i go no it's all good it's working mm. and i oh, i couldn't be where i am now without that way of thinking yeah 
That's beautiful, actually, to listen to that. And I think every day is an opportunity to change. And, you know, we can all think, oh, we're too old, we're too, you know, we're too this, we're too that. But I think if you really are feeling good, you always have the confidence to try and make that change. And keeping the mojo factors in place and, you know, keeping the the daily routine and the rhythm and the things that make you feel good just, I think, enable you and really empower you to make change. And I think change usually comes either when you're feeling really amazing and full of confidence and full of power and full of mojo or in the moments of darkness when everything's gone wrong you've hit rock bottom and you basically have no other opportunity other than to take that or and you know paddle out into a whole new sea entirely because you just don't really know you know what's going to happen and that's kind of exciting but do you think most of the people that you're going to be talking to on this podcast are people that have kind of gone through that process already themselves? There's a lot of, I sort of call them from two stories. Um, and the, 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 the level of where people were and what, um, what shade of light or dark they were in when they made that decision is really varied, actually. Um, some people in, you know, maybe a little bit like I was, in a fairly comfortable position, but just knowing there's something else that they needed to do uh, and, and, and then activating on that. And some people frankly in really really dark circumstances and knowing that right well you know given given where i am there's nothing to lose i might as well just do this because i almost have no alternative so that's that's the fascinating thing and you're absolutely right change comes at different points for people but um if you can be in a position of the former where you are feeling very positive feeling a little bit more in control of what's going on around you you it's probably a better position but then life happens right life happens and then you just you're put in a circumstance and you have a choice you hope you make the right one but without going to a beat the hippy dippy you know what you're doing is helping people get their mojo back and when you've got your mojo flying high it's the law of attraction and i'm sorry but if you're vibrating in that way where your mojo is fully fully stacked then things start to come your way and you're doing the things that make you feel good you're meeting the people that you know are there to help you and support you and you know recreate and continue that feeling I think that that's you know really important in terms of what you're doing because getting people to feel good and really empower themselves obviously will just push them forward to reach those goals and reach their dreams and make those changes that are really going to make them feel even even more amazing yeah you know it's a real it's a real privilege actually being a coach and working with people and, and helping with exactly that, as you said. And when you, when you see, it goes back to, you know, part of my decision around my, my corporate job. It was, you know, I, you, you're doing good work, but where, where is that work manifesting itself? I do good work now. I see it right in front of me. And I see somebody and they, in the moment, they have a realization in the moment, they make a decision about change. And then we come back and a few weeks later, we talk about it. And that gives, just gives me a, an amazing sense of I'm doing some good in the world and pushing, as you say, push that energy out and it'll, it comes back to you. Um, and for that person, um, the changes that they make and the, the uh, fulfillment that they feel as a result is just, just amazing. And that, that, that's what I want to do, frankly. Um, so that's what I, I focus on. So, yeah, more of that. So, I mean, lastly then, I mean... You know, we've talked about all the changes that Abitha has brought into your life and, and enabled you to keep the mojo high. But what other things other than obviously the morning routine that you how has your lifestyle changed here that you feel so much more connected? Um, I think I mean, because when you work for yourself, your 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 day is your own to an extent. I do try and keep broad office hours and I, I say that because I don't want to be my wife's a teacher so she's coming home from from work in the afternoon if I start my day then that's pretty antisocial. um and the idea of moving here was to spend more time together so that's important so um I just set my day the way I, I need it to be but you know getting out just walking the beaches um I do a lot of cycling so I've got some good cycle buddies here um, and there's some fantastic roads and it's so quiet in the winter time. Um, it's just, it's a lovely place to cycle. And I find cycling hugely meditative as well, actually. It's a, you know, it's a very um, kind of when you're going up a hill, it's you 
against the hill and you can decide to stop or turn around or you can keep going and it's it's quite a binary choice um and I, I go into all sorts of interesting places and i have really good conversations actually really good conversations with people when cycling so i love that um and paddle boarding paddle boarding is a new thing for us since we moved here and just getting out onto this this amazing sea that you can probably just hear in the background uh, today would be an amazing day for it i wish i had it with me um paddle around and just be again it's, a, it's another element of meditation in paddle boarding for me it's just very simple so one side the other side you're, you're utilizing both sides of your brain which is really important for accessing um for rational and more creative thinking so if you're more left brain then your right brain stuff comes out and vice versa so mm -hmm. paddle boarding is a great thing to do so yeah, there's a lot of activity you know i'm a very a very active person and this you know what abitha does there are no barriers to it and in london there's loads of things you can do but i created probably so many barriers to doing activity oh the weather can't go out the weather's terrible oh it's across town it'll take me an hour to get there i, I, I can't do that or oh cycling it's a bit dangerous on the roads which which it is um in london sadly so you kind of diminish and take away those barriers to doing to the things that you love doing that give you joy that create energy and for me as i said build my mojo I think people listening to this podcast are going to think, hmm, I wonder when Richard is going to start doing one-to-ones in Ibiza, um, mini retreats for uh, us to come and experience this incredible island that he's uh, obviously fallen deeply in love with. Yeah, and, and this, is the, this is the lovely thing. There's an abundance here. That I, there are things that are sort of not, that are coming my way, not because I haven't done anything to earn that, but because the more you put it out there, the more it comes back to you. And... Some people have said to me, so what, yeah, what are you doing in Ibiza in terms of retreats and coaching? And right now, I'm, it's not really a focus for me. It's more I do a lot in London. I do a lot um, via Skype. But absolutely, this island has this incredible energy, this ability to decompress that I'm sure I'll be either I'm doing something on my own or preferably maybe partnering with some people um, and working on retreats. I think it'd be a great thing to do. My business is uh, a year old this week, and when I sort of wrote my first business plan, it is pretty different to where I am now, because things have um, manifested. And that's a really hard word for me to use, by the way, because I was, as I said a few years ago, very much, I must have controlled this, I will make this happen myself. But the more that I've put out there, the more that has come back, and things are, things are developing really beautifully. And I, my, my rule of thumb is, I just want to do really good work with really good people, and that's it. And that's, that's, that's what the, the fundamental of, uh, of what Mojo Development is about. What a wonderful way to end your very first podcast. I, I'm almost tempted to sign up and do a bit of coaching myself, frankly. Thank you, Joe, for, um, for, for guiding me through that. It was, as I said at the beginning, I was a little bit nervous, but uh, just thank you um, for bringing it all out. And yeah, we'll be doing a lot more of this every week. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the very first edition of the Mojo Podcast. So there you have it. That's episode one of the Mojo Podcast. Uh, it was not the easiest thing, uh, actually, for me to tell my story, but I think Joe did a great job of getting it out of me. And actually, in the end, it was really enjoyable, and actually very cathartic which is how I hope all my guests feel when I interview them each week. If you like what you hear, please do subscribe, give the podcast a five-star rating, and write a quick review. And while we're on it, why not share it with a few friends as well? That'll all be really, really helpful. Next week on the Mojo Podcast, I'm talking to Brie Verity, the founder of Arc Storytelling. She'll be sharing her story, but also talking about how to tell the story you really want other people to hear. Until then... Have a great week. I hope your mojo continues to flow.